Välkommen allihopa. Jag tar det på engelska eftersom det står det i katalogen. So I'll do this in English. Welcome everyone to this seminar. Uh, I am Ingvill Segersham. Uh, I'm the chairman for the Swedish organization HARO, uh, which you can see there on the slides. Uh, HARO is an organization working to empower parents, uh, to encourage parents, and to support both choices, being at home or working uh, somewhere else, uh, staying with your own children or leaving, leaving them with someone else. It should be a choice, a matter of choice. We have the child in focus, um, and we are we're having a lot of seminars over Sweden, encouraging parents, helping parents to attach to um, to um, you know attach to their children and to see their children and to help them parent their children. And we focus on the well-being, the psychological well-being of children as well. So we have um, seminars even for teachers and uh, people working with children um, in developmental psychology and neuro neurobiology as well. So this is what we are doing. We're working internationally as well uh, in, um, in Brussels, in, in Europe, and even in, at the UN. But that's... Enough about us. Today we have uh, this wonderful lecture. She's flying all the way from Hawaii. <laughs> so I think I think nobody else is, has gone that far to come to Sweden and to talk about women's issues. Um, this the title of the seminar is motherhood, and this is something that I feel personal, personally is missing out in the women's movement that we need to encourage mothers as well, motherhood as well. Um, and this is something that Rebecca has written a books about, uh, Baby Love, one of your books, but you also lecture in many other fields as well. Uh, you are the founder of the Third Way Feminism and you are encouraging women all over the world so I just leave the word to you, because oh, okay. you're the one we want to listen to. Okay. So welcome Thank you. very much. Thank you. My soft-spoken sister. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, I'm so glad to see all of you here. Thanks for coming and spending some time with us. Um, I'm going to uh, first thank the lovely, beautiful, powerful women of Haro for all of their work bringing me here. It was not easy to get me all the way from Hawaii <laughs> to here, even though I feel so passionately about the subject. Uh, it was still very many logistics and, um, and much heart and commitment was needed to make this moment happen. So I really want to just take a moment and thank you all, Madeline especially, yeah. Um, and, uh, and she did this, and, and the group did this, so that we could evolve the conversation about motherhood within feminist discourse, yeah? So that we could try to create more space for mothers um, to claim their right to be mothers, and to claim their right to be mothers in the way that they feel organically they want to be mothers, in the, in the, in the discussion of what female empowerment looks like. So I was thinking about... Uh, you know, I've taught here in Sweden many times, and one of the main obstacles that I run into when I start to talk about people's feelings and what how important feelings are <laughs> is a kind of uh, resistance to talking about feelings and to um, a resistance to speaking in the I, you know, about one's own life and believing that your own story can make a difference and change the world. There's something particular about maybe in the water here. I don't know. Um, we can talk a lot about that later. Uh, but, but I always want to encourage and invite your voices um, because I know from first-hand experience that in the States especially, all of the movements for social change, the civil rights movement, the queer movement, um, 
the, the labor movement, all of those changes in our culture came about because people told their own stories that were different from the dominant narrative of the culture, right? So unless, unless I think it's very important to just at least have that as an option um, as you all think about how you want to change the world, to bring your own voice to the table, yeah? And allow people to access that emotion and that power of speaking the truth, your truth. So in support of that, I thought I would read a little bit from my book called Baby Love, which is a memoir about my experience uh, becoming pregnant and becoming a mother, and um, the struggle that I had growing up in a very feminist um, uh, community, extremely, you know, with some of the very powerful leaders of the feminist movement in America. I grew up, do you all know Ms. Magazine? Yeah, okay, so I grew up running around the offices at Ms. Magazine and we can talk about all that later, but um, and and this book is an exploration of my choice to become a mother in the context of uh, people really telling me that motherhood was not the way to become empowered, and that in fact I should be Secretary of State or you know run a huge company and and not worry about becoming a mother. Um, and this is my journey through through my pregnancy and having my child. So I want to start with this just so that you have a sense of of what I do, but also to say, uh, again, how important and powerful it can be to use your own personal experience to talk about what's going on in your lives. So, this is from Baby Love. For the last 15 years, I have told everyone, friends, family, hairdressers, editors, cab drivers, doctors, and anyone else who would listen, that I wanted a baby. I want to have a baby, I would say, with urgency, or a wistful longing, or both. And I meant what I said, I really did. I just had no idea what I was talking about. I had almost no actual experience of babies, and so the object of my wanting was abstract, the display of it ritualized. I want to have a baby was something I said, a statement that evoked a trajectory, a general direction for my life. The truth is I was racked with ambivalence, I had the usual questions, when, with whom, and how the heck was I going to afford it. But there was also something else, a question common, if not always conscious, to women of my generation. Women raised to view motherhood with more than a little suspicion. Can I survive having a baby? Will I lose myself, my body, my mind, my opinions, my options, and be left trapped, resentful, and irretrievably overwhelmed? If I have a baby, so many of us wonder to ourselves, will I, the I that I know, will I die? Because as a writer I do my best research in the lives of others, at least once a week I sat conversing over tea, on subway platforms, at the farmer's market, in ornate fancy hotel lobbies, about motherhood, with women who either had done the deed and lived to tell, or who were surveying the same terrain of possibility. I spoke to single moms and partnered moms and moms who lost their children to disease. I spoke to stay-at-home moms and working moms and CEO moms and moms on welfare. One mom I met conceived through in vitro fertilization at age 45. Another orchestrated different sperm donors over several pregnancies. One became pregnant at 18 and spent the rest of her life trying to recover. One was pregnant... <clears throat> at 18, <laughs> and spent the rest of her life trying to recover. I spent an afternoon talking with a poor mom who relied on faith to provide for her sixth child on the way. I spent several years talking to middle-class moms who couldn't figure out how to support the two kids they already had. I talked to men, too, about the joys and risks of parenthood, but my time with them was different. It wasn't punctuated with anecdotes or held together by narrative. Men explored the topic of my pregnancy with meaningful glances and gentle touches of assurance to the small of my back. They encouraged me with knowing nods and unwavering attention, sometimes slightly offering themselves, other times letting me know they wished it could be them. Women gave me narrative and men gave me alchemy, their approbation running like a current into my womb. My life was full of these elucidating encounters, but strangely, none of them seemed to bring me any closer to what I said I wanted. Unconsciously, I longed to give birth to a child. Consciously, 
I manage the risk of actually having one by viewing it as an option among many, a wonderful possibility to peruse at will, like choosing which coast to live on or what country or what apartment to take. I would consider potential outcomes and make my best informed decision. Because I am a woman of relative privilege, a product of the women's movement, and a student of cultural relativism, I believe that neither choice would be inherently better than the other. Each had pluses and minuses, and so it would not be the choice itself, but how I interpreted the choice that would make the difference. Los Angeles or New York, high floor or great location, to baby or not to baby. Ultimately, it was like trying to steer a boat with a banana. I had no idea what was going on, no clue whatsoever. I didn't know that I was already in the water, that the tide was coming in fast, and that I had no option other than to be taken out to sea. I didn't know that the longing, the fear, and ambivalence were part of my pregnancy, the birth and everything that came after. I didn't know that the showdown between the ideas of my mother's generation and my own was inescapable and slated to play out personally. I didn't know that these 15 years constituted my first real trimester, and all that time my baby was coming toward me and I was moving toward my baby. What I did know is that I had mothered or tried to mother every single human being who had crossed my path including the son of a, por a former partner of six years. And I had tried to mother all of these souls to the point of absurdity, exhaustion, and everything in between. What I did know is that one year in a stunning lagoon in Mexico, I had a vision of two babies, my babies, and at the very moment their copper faces smiled at me in my mind's eye, two tiny silver fish leapt out of the sea, inches from my lips. What I did know is that even though I doubted my ability to mother, to partner, to work, to evolve, and serve all at the same time, some part of this flesh body I call my own was being pulled toward birth, my babies and my own. So that just gives you a sense, yeah, of the beginning of my journey into motherhood and how powerful it was for me. And thinking really, you know, it, we want to talk today about how important it is for women to have the choice to either have a child or not have a child, to be supported in staying home with the child or going to work or finding a healthy balance between the two, yeah? But for me, this longing was something... Um, that I realized I didn't, I, I had a choice, but, but on a deep psychological level, I didn't. I needed to have this child in order to have a kind of maturation of my being, you know? And so it was, I was being pulled by that. Hmm? So now I'm just going to shift and talk a little bit more um, theoretically about how feminism has been represented in the movement uh, and how motherhood has been represented in feminism. Yeah? Hello. <laughs> so the women's movement, as we all know, I think, here in this room, has been understandably wary of motherhood, distancing itself from motherhood because of its association um, with essentialist ideas of what it means to be a woman. So essentialist ideas of what it means to be a woman, uh, the idea that women are just a vessel, right, that women are created to have children, to, um, to labor, um, that women sh do better in, at, in the home, that we are supposed to by nature, uh, because we are women and have this anatomy, to be at home and to be outside of the public sphere. Um, that essentialist notion uh, has made the women's movement and feminism understandably wary about embracing motherhood. Um, there is a belief that once you become a mother, uh, and this is because of the history, again, of women who've had children, that you become enslaved to your child in many ways, that you lose your ability to, um, to thrive, to be creative, to be uh, autonomous, um, that you become much more vulnerable to poverty, to exploitation, and, and all of those things historically have been very true. So it's understandable that the feminist critique of motherhood exists. We've needed it. We've needed to raise awareness about the ways in which motherhood has been kind of a trap, yeah, for many women over many, many generations. 
As a result, however, the mainstream feminist message about motherhood is shaped by this idea that as long as motherhood is feminized, women will never be equal in fact or in deed, and so the discourse shies away from a middle ground on the issue, language that honors both the desire to have and raise children and the desire to avoid doing so at all. <laughs> this rejection of motherhood as a viable choice for women an actual profound path to psychic and spiritual evolution and self-realization has created a wound in many women, yeah? Women who feel that while they deeply believe in the need for equality across the board, the very groups, the women's movement, the very feminist groups that are supposedly or who, who are allegedly speaking on their behalf have marginalized them, yes? have marginalized these women and their longing to become mothers and has rendered a huge part of their lives invisible and has even penalized them for their choices to become mothers. Hmm? So this message that the work of raising healthy members of society with strong familial attachments, um, that it is less important than fundamentally secular work outside the home, has alienated um, uh, many women from the mo from the movement itself, and also it is an incomprehensible thought to me. I don't know if it is for you, but um, you know the idea that we all have come from mothers, right? Every single one of us, <laughs> um, and uh, most women in the world are now or will become mothers, right? Um, and that mothers have performed some of the most significant work of humankind from the first human being that has ever walked the planet, right? So if you imagine, you know, that many people who have been mothers, it's incomprehensible to think that the choice to become a mother and to prioritize the familial unit and to, um, and to devote one's life to that project, it's incomprehensible to so many of us when we think about that, that that discussion has not been a part of the feminist narrative, that there's been an avoidance of, of really embracing that truth. Hmm? So, um, so I, I, you know, when I was growing up, I got the message, as I said, that having a child was not a road to joy or empowerment. It was something that would first and foremost enslave me. It would rip all motivation and creativity from me, and it would entrap me. I would not be free because I would be beholden to a man for support. Having a child meant I would lose my autonomy and, of course, my hopes of a powerful career. And a powerful career, as I was growing up, was um, described as... Um, the way, the, the main way for a woman to become fulfilled and, and, and to have um, powerful self-expression, that that was, that was the mode, that was the, uh, the way. Um, the message that I got was that as long as women had children, they could never enjoy freedom, and that maybe this was going to be possible when patriarchy was over, but who knows when patriarchy would be over, so best to just leave it, you know, till after you got your PhD and you had become, you know, the head of a company. <laughs> Um, and then, though, when I was 19, I fell very deeply in love with a man in a big family who lived on another continent and experienced firsthand a closeness and stability with him and his family that I had never known. Uh, watching him with his mother, whom he adored and gave, uh, you know, he would work all day and then come home and give his mother all of the money that he made. And he gave it to her, and she would then allocate all of the resources to all of the various children and to running the home. And watching him do that, and then in turn watching her nurturing her children, beaming with pride at their accomplishments, nudging them this way and that to steer them in a positive direction, and to affect not only their lives but the lives of their larger community, was very moving to me. Um, I was deeply affected by the loyalty and devotion her children showed her. The return to her each night, the efforts made to obey and thus in her culture to show love and respect and protect fiercely that which we love the most, was a powerful teaching for me on what it means to be a human being, to be embedded within a powerful family with strong attachments, yeah? To feel that that is a place like a warm bed that you can relax in. <laughs> 
that it is not a place of discord, but a place of peace, was very outside of my experience. The closeness I saw, the familiarity between mother and son, and even the tensions that ran high between mother and daughter sometimes, all of these revealed a life firmly rooted in these familial bonds. This experience for me stoked a latent uh, longing to have a child, and I began to dream about having children with this man and of becoming a part of his family, encircled in its complicated, though serene, embrace. However, instead of staying with this man that I loved, I followed the imperative of my culture and community and decided to return to university and leave those dreams of becoming a mother behind Within a few months of returning to university, I began to have nightmares. Yeah, constant. Actually, they weren't really nightmares. They were daymares. They were a constant kind of interruption in my thought of a, of a persistent image. And the image was of my breasts being chopped off by a, by a butcher knife, by a big knife on a butcher block. And it, it haunted me. And um, eventually, I started to talk with... Um, uh, psychologist about it because it was really upsetting, right? You can imagine. And we started to, to look closely at whose hand was on the knife, who was cutting off my breasts, you know? And then I identified that the hand was my own and that in some ways I was inflicting this, this on my own body. And I started to recognize that um, part of this was I, feel, I felt that I had left behind um, this longing to be a mother and to provide sustenance and to move forward in following that intuitive desire, right? And that I was, I, was, I was mutilating myself by doing that, by turning my back on my own motherhood. And it was as if I had left um, the free and surprising land of intuition. It was as if I had stepped out of the flow of what we might call cosmic consciousness and had been dropped back into a world that was cold and barren, that was shaped, really, by the rational and the ordered and the controlled, by really the mechanical, right? By, by the imperatives that came from an intellectualization of human reality, not the intuitive, um, deep psychic longing of human reality. I felt that I had been forced to abandon the fruits of my body um, for the products of my mind, yeah? That there was a demand for me to produce and to thus enter into an economic paradigm in which the, the, the activity of my mind was more important to the larger GDP than having, than having a child, right? Um, so the calls of the outside world were to get to work and stop wasting time thinking about things like babies, I heard again and again that thinking about babies was for little girls, not for real women. Huh? So many years later, so, so uh, you know, mm, mm. so I was working on that because that was terrible and I couldn't keep going. Um, but many years later, after I graduated from university and I founded an organization for young women's development and empowerment, I published several books on many subjects, including new masculinity, intergenerational feminism, and multiracial identity, and I spoke at hundreds of universities around the world, I knew, even as I had achieved this kind of public success in my career, I knew that there was something missing. Um, I was giving a tremendous amount, but when I was quiet with myself, I heard that same voice from within, the one that wanted, craved, and hungered to give birth. One night I shared my desire with the man who had become my son's father. And to my surprise, his response was that I should and that we could have a child and that the expense would change my life forever. Not the expense, the experience would change my life forever. The expense, too, would change my life forever. Um, he assured me, yeah, it was a big expense. He assured me that I should not be afraid to give birth. However, here, it's not as big an expense. <laughs> it's not as big as an expense as it is in the States unless you decide to stay home with your child, at which point it becomes a huge expense, huh? That's what we're talking about today, right? The ability for women to choose to stay home and not be penalized economically, how important that is. Um, and it's wonderful that you have a starting place for that discussion. You know, in the States, it's very, uh, 
it's not as um, the possibility is very hard to imagine because we aren't ever compensated for having children, you know. So the idea of being compensated, you know, to be at home with your child is very far. <laughs> so anyway, but that's one of the things that we're here to talk about. So he assured me that I should not be afraid to give birth. And this is a man who was supporting me in this way. It was very interesting. I did not expect it. Um, and he told me that perhaps in giving birth, I would find that I was giving birth to a part of myself that wanted to be born that perhaps the experience had something to offer me, that perhaps my call to motherhood was coming from a place deep within, a valid and sacred place, that perhaps my child was waiting for me to bring him into being. And this was a call for me to open myself and grow. He said that it was not just to have a child because the culture told me to, or because I was expected to, but because bearing a child may be part of my journey to become fully human fully in touch with something bigger than myself, bigger than my own ego. When I look back on my life now, when I look back on this last, my son is nine, so when I look back on this last decade, perhaps the day, actually in my whole life, perhaps the day that is most indelible, obviously for many of you who've had children, is the day that I gave birth. Huh? And the whole world changed, right, in a moment. After being an outsider for so long, yeah, because... I grew up in a very, um, as a multiracial person, as somebody who moved constantly, I was always, a, I, I never felt I was a part of any one world. I felt like I belonged to many worlds, but also no world, right? But so in that one moment, my whole world changed after be, being an outsider. I found an identity that was unshakable for me, irretrievably solid, and that was the identity of mother. I felt I finally belonged to this enormous club, <laughs> you know, and that even the word mother was not enough to describe the transformation that I had undergone. I, I went into the hospital as one person and I came out as two. I went in as someone concerned primarily only for myself and I came out as someone whose oh. ability to care about others had expanded a millionfold. I recognized that day as a fundamental and profound maturational process that taught me that my life, anyone's life, all of our lives, is not just about us, right? That I, that we are all profoundly connected and beholden to one another. And that identity, the small self, right, our small selves, is just the beginning of this human journey. And that the opening up to the infinite sky beyond our egos is an invitation to a space of enlightenment, yeah? a space of openness, a space of empathy for others that is very hard, I think, to achieve, or I found it very hard to achieve before I had my son. Huh? The letting go of a kind of selfishness. Um, and that, you know, well, okay. And now I can see, you know, years later, as I look about, at all of my friends and peers who have quieted their feelings of ambivalence, as I did, and gone ahead to have children, that though exhausting, challenging, and sometimes seemingly impossible, our worlds have opened in many ways from our children's births, not closed. Our hearts have grown as our capacity to love has increased. My friends speak of relating to all mothers across the world, to a new level of empathy that extends beyond their small sphere. They tell me they are so grateful to have had a child, not to have missed the moment, and that their child has made them bigger, has taught them how to love unconditionally, and so tap into the power of humanity to feed us at a very foundational level. And here, when I speak about motherhood, I'm not just talking about giving birth, right? I'm talking about everything after, including and perhaps especially the extraordinary demands, the daily demands of raising a child, the creativity involved in raising a child, the stamina, the wit, the deep intelligence, and the selflessness that makes you grow and not shrink, soar and not fail, because so much is riding on you as a mother, as a parent, right? It's riding on you to show up, it's much larger than the latest project that you've accomplished at work. It's the latest project instead in this ongoing project of human evolution. We are creating the future when we mother our children. So 
While many have already discussed the agony of parenthood, the fact that it does not make you necessarily happier, <laughs> many more have said straight away, um, have you read all of that research? There's a lot of research right now about how motherhood, even though it gives you this deep sense of satisfaction, you're not necessarily happier <laughs> because it's, it's very challenging. Um, anyway, but, but even with all of this research and the truth of it, um, uh, I know that all of the women that I've spoken to would not trade this gift of motherhood for any other in the world, yeah. I remember when I was asking my doctor, my my uh, obstetrician, before I had my son. You know, I was very nervous, and I said, "Are you sure I should be doing this? What if I'm making a horrible mistake?" And she said, "I've delivered thousands of babies, and I have never once heard a mother say that she was sorry to have a child. But I've, but I have heard many women say that they are sorry that they did not have a child. Mm. That was very powerful to me." So, um, becoming a mother taught me how, how to be a better person, et cetera, and so forth. Um, I have an anecdote here that, that's actually interesting. So, so it, 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 becoming a mother was, was about opening my consciousness and becoming connected to people of all over the world, to mothers and to children and to being a part of creating the future and, um, and feeling this empathy. But also it soothed something in me that was a kind of existential anxiety about being alone huh? and, and not having deep familial attachment because I had grown up as a child of divorce and I had trouble with attachment because my parents had, had split up and my mother was ambivalent about having a child and all of that. Um, and the man, the first man that I fell in love with who made me want to have a child in the first place, uh, I remember him saying many times when I was with him, he, he lived in Kenya, I would say, I need time alone. I need space alone, you know. And, and he would say, well, just, okay, he would say, okay, but then he wouldn't leave the room. <laughs> and nobody would. I'd say, I need solitude, you know, I need to spend, be alone. And they would all say, fine, be alone. And, and I, I said, well, why aren't you leaving? And, and they said, well, you can just be alone with us. Like, there's no alone, you know. And then I said, no, but I want alone alone. And, 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 they, and they said, no, you, when you die, you're alone, you know. And it was very interesting to me. And I started to recognize a different way of looking at the world. And for me, having a child ma meant that I would never be alone again, you know, not just because of my care for my child, but because of having this incredible web of understanding of the human experience in this very primal way, you know. So, so you know, this is my view of, of how important motherhood can be psychologically, psychically, emotionally, politically, culturally. Um, and, and I want to add a few thoughts about how I think feminism can change and how, we, how the feminist language, our view, our lens that we look at motherhood through can, can be shifted, right, so that we can accommodate all of the desires and all of the needs and, and all of the different ways that we as individuals need to, um, to grow, right? And so the first thing that I think feminism must do is to acknowledge the possibility that giving birth and becoming a mother and actually raising your own child, right, um, may be one of the most powerful and satisfying and important and empowering experiences of your life. For in, in the states, this is very hard too. I mean, the, the the idea that we would allow, that we would say, that you know, more than anything else I've accomplished, having a child is by far the greatest thing that I've done, you know, and I think that feminism must begin to include that idea that empowerment can come in so many ways, including the 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 giving birth and the raising of your children. For me, certainly, having my son um, is more powerful, has been a more powerful and empowering experience than any book I've written or any talk I've given 
or any anything, right? I mean, I remember and when I look back on my life, I remember two things, you know, the two days that, that stick out to me are the day I gave birth and the day I graduated from college. So it's not to say that we abandon our own intellectual power um, or, or any of those things, but both are deeply important. And if I had to choose one, well, I, hopefully I would not have to choose one. That's the whole point. We don't want to choose one. But, you know, if I had to, it would be having my son, yeah? Because I evolved into someone that I, I, I think is a better person as a result. Um, so we must, we must make uh, this discussion of equal pay and equal rights and all the different things that we're talking about here, the deconstruction of identity, um, we must you know, continue to do that work. But also we must acknowledge that biology is a very strong factor in, in our identities and our lives. So much of what the women's movement has done is to deconstruct identity to the point of, um, of, of all of it being considered, all of who we are being considered just a social narrative that we have taken on. But in fact, um, I would posit, right, that biology, it, it, there is no need to be afraid of biological urges and desires. Our biological, um, our physiological, um, urges are what have brought all of us here to begin with, right? <laughs> I mean, sure, we can say that heterosexuality and, um, you know, is, you know, socially constructed in many ways, but at the same time, our longing for intimacy with another, that is something that I think is, is universal in every culture. Huh? So, so there must be something there. And so the women's movement needs to, I think, become much more comfortable with the idea of biology and not so afraid, you know, understandably we've been afraid because we've been so victimized by our anatomy and being thought of as women only, you know, in that narrow way. But I think now, um, now, hopefully, we can allow for both, right? It's very important. Um, so so to, to identify that it can be the most empowering thing, yeah, even if you're poor, even if you're so marginalized in the culture, even if you're oppressed, in, even if you're you know, a product or a victim of all kinds of different assaults, even, even then, you know, having a child can be a healing process. It can be. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be, but it can be. And, we, and I think we need to give that space because you know, it's like um, there are so many ways to heal injuries. And we don't really, you know, we think, oh, well, you go to the hospital or you go to the psychiatrist or you go, you know, but we don't think in terms of the possibility of our own bodies and our own intuitive forces taking us in a direction of healing. And so actually having a child could be, you know, the most healing experience for someone who's been sexually violated. We don't know, yeah? So, so to be open to that possibility that it is a remedy, um, a medicine, yeah? So I think also, especially here in Sweden, I've been talking with um, friends and colleagues about some of the experiences uh, of women here with, with having a child and your attempt um, to hold on to that child, you know, that, you know, at, when the child is one, right, after your leave, you have to give the child to the daycare, right? Yeah. And there's a sense of, um, of deep loss for some mothers at having to do that. And yet the state demands that of you. Hmm? And so this discussion of um, suppressing that painful emotion of separation in the name of an idea that this is the best thing for the country, right, or for others, yeah, is very painful to me to think about that you are expected to do that. In the States, we also are expected, you know, and we don't have a year, we have a six weeks maternity leave, if you can imagine, and that's if you're lucky. And then you do have to find daycare, you do have to find help, but there's a language around the grieving process of breaking away from your child in that way. And there's an understanding that it is it is, it is not necessarily the best thing for, for mother or for child. It's not. 
you know, so much of the movements now happening in the States have to do with attachment and understanding how the primary attachment between mother and child sets the stage for how children can become attached to others in the world, which means, again, that not only do mothers gain empathy when they have children, but healthily attached mothers and children, children are able to interact more healthily with others as they grow up and as they create the world in the future. And we need that. We need our children to be able to relate in a healthy way to others, not to be shut down and fearful because they've been abandoned or they feel they've been abandoned by their mothers. Yeah. So I think it's important um, to break the cycle of expecting women to give up their right to bond with their children. Mm? So in, in the States, there's a strong expectation that we will separate, you know, so that women can work and support themselves. But there's not an expectation that the bond is, is not primary and that you, that you are expected to give that up. You know what I mean? And I feel here that you are, you know. And, and so I think that feminism should, you know, this discussion should include this breaking of the cycle of expecting women to give up their right to bond with their children. Um, and I, that's very important because if you are expected to, to give up that right, then this, your emotions, your sense of who you are, your, your, the things that things that make up your, your feeling body <laughs> are so deeply suppressed, you know. And then you expect the child, a small infant, you know, a year old, to suppress their own feelings of need and longing. Uh -huh. and, and what does that do to human beings, you know? It's a very important question. I know that if I can't express some of my feelings even now, you know, with people that I love, with, with you, um, I will feel a deep sense of being sort of incomplete. You know, part of my journey in life is to have moments like this where I can express my feelings and hear your feelings and we can then create a community in this space together and then we can continue to grow and talk and, and move forward. But if I had to repress all of that, I don't know how I would honestly relate to you all. You know, and so... I've, I've spent quite a bit of time here in Sweden, and I've had to do a lot of work. I teach writing. Um, I've taught writing to PhD students at Linköping. I've taught writing to people all over the country. And helping people to talk about what they feel has been the hardest part of the work I've done. And one of the things that people say when I say, well, what was your experience? What did you feel? Is that they're afraid to say that because on some level they feel they will be silenced. You know, that people will think that they think they're better than someone else just because they have a feeling and they think they should be heard. Yeah? And so when I've taught and I've encouraged, sometimes people cry spontaneously and they don't know why because no one has ever invited them to, 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 to share their feelings, because they were supposed to just sort of be good soldiers in some way for the state or for what was the best thing, you know. So I think we have to, um, if, we, if we really believe in women's freedom and women's equality and justice, if we really believe in those things, then we must honor all of who we are, not just... Um, us as sort of abstract bodies who are subject to various kinds of sub subjugation, but that we are also um, deeply um, emotional and intuitive and alive, uh, uh, you know, uh, collections of matter. You know what I mean? There's something, we're bigger than, than that other idea. And sometimes that big idea is what can bring us home. It is what can heal us, right? So, which reminds me of another small anecdote. <laughs> um, I had a great teacher once who told me uh, that the mind, our mind, 
is big, vast, like the sky, right? Like sky mind. You've heard of sky mind, sort of like in the Buddhist, you know, okay. Well, so he, he taught me that our minds are very vast. And the ideas that we have in our minds, the ideas, the ideologies, all the different things that we believe, those are like stars in our mind, right? They're like, they're like a space matter. But there's far more empty, dark, vast space that is the space of potential than there is these little planets, right? So there's more space than there is ideas, right? So, so we, we need to drop into the space, the spaciousness, and not be fixated on these few smaller ideas that we're holding on to so tightly. Our identity really can be in the openness. Huh? And that space is the space of intuitive becoming. You know, it's always a space in which other things can come into being. So we're way bigger than we think we are. So I think that feminism needs to include this idea, which is a, is a kind of a spiritual idea, but it's also a philosophical idea. Yeah. Um, and finally, you know, well, in some ways I've said it now many times, but, but you know, it's very significant to me that here in this conference, motherhood is not really being talked about much. And I think we are the only group, this small, beautiful group of us, that, um, that has come together to talk specifically about the power of motherhood. And this is a huge conference, yeah? And so, um, you know, what is up with that, as we would say? <laughs> like, what's going on with that? And, and so I would just, you know, say that we need to claim motherhood as a feminist issue, you know, as a feminist ground to work from you know, for the healing, not just of women, but for all humanity, that it is a space of infinite potential. Um, when we think about changing the world, not just for women, but for, but for all of us, because if we think of it as a space where people become um, whole again, and when people, where people can cultivate empathy for others who are different from themselves, then we realize that this space is, is, is critical, it's crucial for, for our evolution. Yeah? So I, w I want feminism to do that. And that's one of the reasons that I'm here today, is just to contribute to this growing conversation, right, about the importance of claiming this as a powerful uh, space. Okay, so that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So then we, we, we want to take some questions from you, if you have some questions. Yeah. Wait, 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 we must wait for the microphone, yes? Turn it on to Okay, I uh, come from Serbia. We, I mean, yes. And uh, I first, I want to thank you for this uh, beautiful uh, uh, talk about your personal experience. Mm. Uh, but I also noticed some differences, perhaps because of the background that we come from. Yes. And uh, in my country, for example, I think it is very mu much important to accentuate. Uh, the right to women uh, not to have children. Yes. Because it's quite a taboo. Yes. And uh, uh, for uh, the most girls, it yes. is absolute imperative to have children. Yes. So, um, and it is impl uh, implicitly uh, uh, recognized as the, the biggest achievement for a woman, but not for a man. Mm. So mm -hmm. that's, I think, important uh, difference. And th this kind of ideology is uh, used to limit... Uh, influence of women in a public sphere very effectively, yes. I have to say. Uh, so um, it, 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 it also combines from uh, influence from United States of attachment parenting. Yes. Uh-huh. Definitely. Yeah. Very important. So, so it is often uh, talked about the importance uh, of bond between mother and the child, but not between a father and a child or a 
uh, different par uh, members of a family yes. and the children. So I think it's uh, always important to uh, accentuate that uh, um, men also have this opportunity to, um, uh, to be fully human and to achieve all this. Absolutely. So, yeah. I totally agree. Okay, and I it's so important. I'm so glad that you that you I mean, because it's really a conversation, you know, and 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 it depends on our lens and where we, we are coming from, you know, wh how how to shape this conversation. And um, I've spent a lot of time. I wrote a whole book about men <laughs> and how I feel they've been um, that there's a kind of war on men in my culture that when you try to step outside of the masculinity box of being sort of stoic emotionally and not connected to your children that you're punished very harshly in the states you know there's there's verbal um, punishment that many boys are beaten when they try to step out of that and so I often talk about how important it is for men to to become caretakers and real true parents to their children and to open up emotionally and be vulnerable and also grow through the process. So I, I'm so with you on that. Um, I wanted, I think, to speak specifically about women's experience here just because, um, I don't know why, but because, you know, all of the people that I've spoken to have been women, you know, here about this experience. And, and also, my, my view of Sweden is that there are so many more men involved in raising their children. And I could be completely wrong, but, it, but it comparatively, I'm, I'm wrong. People are looking at me like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, because, I, you know, I, but, and I could be, because we have generally a very utopic idea of Sweden, you know, that it's a, the most wonderful progressive country in the world, and women are so happy, and all of this, and men are so involved. But I wanted to, to speak specifically to women, because uh, I knew that most of you would be women. But but I, I really I really am glad that you made that note and I fully agree. Um, and it will be much easier for us to claim that experience if we have strong help, <laughs> you know. And uh, yeah, and you know, yes. Anyway, so yes, thank you for contributing that that thought. Do you think though that? Do you think that encouraging women not to have children is the is the is the right response to that cultural imperative for them to have children? No, no, I would think the choice should be equal for men and women. Uh -huh. Maybe contribute to society in another way or whatever. But in Serbia women who cannot have children. Yes. Right, right. There are some that cannot have children and they are uh, looked uh, down upon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, though, if you wanted to change that, would you, would you suggest that women not have children or would you suggest that becoming a mother is not an empowering act? Uh, becoming a mother for me is a very empowering act, but there are many other empowering processes that, and paths that uh, human beings can take. Yes. Yes. Yeah, no, I'm just wondering if we were to start a reform, you know, the reform movement for that kind of oppression, like what would our language be? Because that's what happened here, right? So, or not here in Sweden, but in, in the States. So it's the same. The expectation of girls and women is that you would have children. And if you're barren or if you don't have children, you're looked down upon, right? But so the response within the feminist dialectic or discourse has been that women should not have babies and that it is not a great choice. And I'm not sure that that as an intervention is actually the best way. You know what I mean? So I'm just wondering if we have other ideas, you know, because we have to develop new language for, for this kind of social change as opposed to just it's bad, you know. Um, so this is very important work for us to do. Are you telling me about time? Oh, okay, no, you I have, have a question. question. I okay. have a question. Okay. Okay. Oh, you have a question. You have the mic, yeah. so yeah, you have I'm, the power I've been right now. Here with it, okay. So. We'll no, I, I'm just talking out of a Swedish standby, uh, point of view because here I feel like you know people. It's kind of okay to have children, you know, because we do have such a system that yes. you know you will be able to have a career and you can kind of work and do everything. Um, 
I, I chose to stay home longer than my, um, the insurance that I had from the States. And what I, I've kind of, you know, talked to friends and stuff like that about it. And it, sometimes I get that feeling like I let other women down. Right. Because when I, you know, when I, st when I stay home, I was not going to stay home as long as I did. But, you know, because I did, you know, one kid came after another. So it ended up being 18 years. Wow. So, but I do have my own company now and I have a career and everything is going good. Uh -huh. But I did hear, you know, quite often that I was letting other women down. Yes. And I think that was kind of harder in some ways than letting the state down. Or You know yes. what I mean? It's like... Totally. It was because I ruined their um, paychecks and stuff like that. It was all uh. kinds of... Do you understand, like, the, the, yes, I understand. the pay, the, the way how pay works? So. Oh, well, I, I don't understand how pay works, but I do understand this idea. I felt it very mm -hmm. strongly that by having a child somehow, I was letting down the movement. <laughs> you know what I mean? That I was failing the movement, you know, by putting so much emphasis on it, um, that I was somehow endorsing this notion of biology and that I was concurring that, the patriarchy was right in saying that there was an essential feminine identity. And I felt a lot of guilt about that. It was very hard. And I did, but now, yes. like 18 years later, and yeah. I've had my company for six years, yeah. I'm so happy I did it the way I did. I had the kids, and now I'm running my company. And sometimes I feel like, you know, like in Sweden, everything has to happen between 25 or 30 and 40, you know what I mean? Right. Instead of, I started my company at 40. Right. You know, so anyway, it's just a, I don't know how we can get that point across here, though. The because point that, that you can just do things like you're explaining. You can do, uh, like you said, you could do, you could stay home a little bit longer than right. life insurance. So right. anyway, that was just. Well, that's really one of the things that I wanted to talk to just, uh, you know, talk about is how, how we can further that discussion here in Sweden, you know. Um, yes. Um, yesterday um, afternoon, there was a discussion about um, migrant women mm -hmm. or minority women, and motherhood did come up in that discussion oh, good. Um, in the sense that uh, there is a stereotype, especially among the non-black or non-minority uh, women movement, basically the White Nordic women. women's movement, uh -huh. um, that migrant women uh, come here and they just want to have babies so they can gain benefits from the state. Uh-huh. And then um, also that um, they don't want to work. Uh -huh. uh, like they don't, they don't want to actually go out to the workplace um, because they're put in such a, a box, you know, they're stereotyped, um, when actually there's women of both that want to do both. They want to stay home with their children. Maybe their culture uh, allows them to do that more. Um, or, and they also want to gain the economic empowerment. But um, in general... When we look at the Nordic uh, women's movement and especially how very little space there are for migrant or refugee women, um, there's a sense that uh, we're not feminists or we, we, are, we don't believe in women's rights because um, we want to be mothers and we're also we're not queer enough right. in, in that sense, which is um, just a very perplex uh, situation to be in because, like you said, you know, motherhood is such a very sacred uh, thing. Um, you know, and, and that, I don't know, it's, I think it's, it's not just a threat to humanity, but a threat to the feminine that, that yes. would be um, suppressed. Um, I, I have a question. Sure. Um, well, that was beautifully, beautifully said. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, sometimes, well, when I had uh, my son, like, like I had, had that whole thing, like, you know, the, the whole humanity, the love, like a million times just more bigger. I mean, I... I cry at the littlest things, and I, you know, because I just feel so much uh, more connected to the world. Um, but not all mothers are like that, you know. You have some yes. funny mothers. Uh, I have a friend of mine that um, she gave birth about a couple weeks ago, and we we're talking about like how it changes us so much. But then there's some mothers who don't seem to do that. For instance, at the um, they call it like the baby hospital or hotel. Um, she couldn't. She would not leave her son out of her sight, but she saw other women um, leave the baby in, uh, in the sort of rolling bed thing while they stepped outside to smoke a cigarette. Yeah. And um, I, we were wondering, like, how is that? And then we were guessing that maybe one, to just lack a certain amount of education, maybe just the whole society doesn't really, they, they haven't been able to allow, 
to really connect with that type of motherhood. And then I also have the theory that maybe um, epidurals might play a role because I know that the pain of labor just really um, uh, changed me. <laughs> what, 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 oh, what, oh, oh, oh you, uh-huh. I'm sorry. No, it, I mean, it changed me in the sense that, um, okay, like the whole myth that men are stronger than women is just like the biggest lie of humanity. I mean, they don't even go through menstrual cramps, let alone like something as huge as labor. Like women really are the strongest. I mean, I, I was always advocating for women's rights and uh, especially in peace building before uh, giving birth. But now that I actually did it, it's like that is why the world is not a great place because mothers are not given the platform to discuss these things because they know that type of sacrifice. They know the real pain and they, they, they you know. Mm -hmm. um, but why do we have those, you know, funny those, mothers, do you uh, think? that they? they uh, uh -huh. <laughs> well, I, I know that situation very intimately, actually. Um, you know, it's hard to say, you know, why. Um, I think there's, you know, for every woman who, who doesn't have that feeling, there's a different reason, you know. Um, I don't think that... Uh, I don't think that all women want to be mothers or that they should, you know. Um, and I know in my own life, my experience with women who don't have this experience that we're talking about as mothers, it's almost like they're missing a gene. <laughs> I always, it's like the maternal gene is not quite there. And, and I don't, I can't, I don't want to say that, that, you know, I mean, that's kind of not, a, it's, um, but I guess what I'm saying is I think it's it's important to say that too and to give women permission not to have children if they don't want to because I think some women do hope that they'll have a positive experience or have or feel that they have to but to just say you know no you know you you don't have to if you don't have that longing don't have one you know and when I when I wrote baby love there were so many women in my generation. People now come and tell me, like in airports, randomly, I had a baby because I read your book, you know, and I was afraid to have a baby, and I had a baby, you know, and and that feels really wonderful. But now that I have a nine-year-old and not a two-year-old, um, <laughs> sometimes when women come to me and they're ambivalent and they don't know, you know, they're like, I don't know if I, should, you know, and I and I have to say to them, you know, if you don't know. You maybe you should not have one, <laughs> you know, because it, it takes everything, you know, and you're going to need that desire to lead you through. So I've even evolved in my thinking about it. Um, and I, I can't say why. I think there's so many reasons, you know. Some women are, are, who knows what the bond is with the father? You know, who knows what the future will be with a child? Who, you know, the, the fear of it. Um, it's not always idyllic, you know, and especially as you're talking about, as in, in the states as well, women of color are often thought of as, um, you know, we we want to preserve the right for white women primarily to have children, and we we see that as noble in some ways, yeah, and yet when women of color have children, there's this idea that we're somehow trying to get money from the state, and that's you know that's why we're having children, and you know that's that's a fundamentally sort of racist um, um, view, I mean, just plain and simple. And in fact, it's, um, it's really an ignorance about how primary the family has been in communities of color all over the world, you know. And um, so I really relate to that and think that it's really important to continue to challenge people who want to say that we are just trying to somehow, you know, benefit financially and that it's not our own longing that's at the heart of it, you know. Um, and I've spoken to many actually immigrant groups here as well as transracially adopted people, Swedes, um, and the ways in which those communities are marginalized and stigmatized are profound. 
and um, and I think that being able to speak more freely and more openly about the challenges is really important. So I'm glad, so in a short response, I'm really glad you came, is what I'm saying. And I'm really glad that you told your story, you know, because, because all of these women and all of the women here need to hear all of the voices and all of the perspectives, including the Serbian perspective, you know? So thank you. Who has the, ah, my friend. Yeah. Uh, so I seem to be the only father here, so I'd like to yes. say something about that. Yes. I think when you know, we were going to have children, I was reasonably interested in that, perhaps more than many usual. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife, she said, you know, she would only have children if, if the child was born at home. Mm. There would be the family bed. There would be attachment parenting. There would be breastfeeding for three years for each child, at least, etc., etc., etc. So even with that interest, I would not be sitting here or have the depth of experience without a wife that deeply into motherhood. Yes. So I'm trying to say is that it is mothers who bring the fathers into parenthood at least to a new depth. Yes, I completely agree with that. I mean, that's been my experience. So I thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. So so that speaks a little bit to what what you're saying, you know, about just, you know, I think the more that we embrace the process, the more we are able to bring our partners, if they are men, into it. Yeah. So that's beautiful. Yay for your wife. <laughs> I don't have a, I don't have a seat. You have to have me. Yeah. Okay. Like uh, the rest of the group, I talk. wish to say thank Whatever. you very much yeah. for a uh, very interesting speech. Oh. Uh, and uh, uh, my comment or, or perspective is that uh, uh, I think when you said that uh, uh, we have to kind of challenge the idea from patriarchy saying that uh, this is essentialism, we that, uh, that uh, it really is something that could be also be conservative and kind of dangerous to the feminist movement, uh, I also think that the critique towards essentialism within feminist theory and the feminist movement itself mm. since the 80s, 90s made it very difficult to even um, talk about these kind of things th yes. that you are talking about now. Yeah. Um, and that has struck me many times that uh, uh, this kind of silence that you talk about is really something that you can see in the Swedish culture today. Yes. And the norm in Sweden related to the official policy of equality between men and women is to become a mother. Mm. In Sweden, the possibility to be married, living, and having children, and combine with paid work, that is the norm. Mm. So I would say that this kind of openness that you have in the United States of talking about the choice, mm. that doesn't exist in Sweden. Mm. So... So the comment that you said that you could give to somebody on the airport, mm. maybe you shouldn't. Mm. That is something that you are never saying in mm. Sweden. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is also something that perhaps should be needed to be said. Yes. But I think one problem that we do have mm -hmm. is that the equality policy saying that we need to change the masculinity yes. and we need to change the role of the men the, the, the mean to do that, the method, yeah. is through parenting. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so this also means there is like a competition mm. in, in many ways between mm. who should parent and in what way and so on. And I would say many times it is the masculine norm mm -hmm. that makes this silence mm -hmm. because sitting and talking at the coffee table at the work about how bad you feel when you left your child on the childcare this morning because he or she was crying. You're not really doing that. Right. So I say thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thank you. Could, should we take um, s a couple of questions yeah. at the same time? You can take uh, every, yeah. whatever and then you think is and best. And try to make it short, and then we try to... As and I'll try know, to make to my answers short. As many as possible too. to ask the question. Oh, thank you. Okay, thank so you, you and then... You. Okay. Whatever you like, I'm here for you. I've come a long way to be here with you, so I could stay forever. Uh huh. I, me too. I will try to make myself uh, short okay. and clear. Um, uh, I was late, but when I entered the room, 
I felt the atmosphere that didn't come from these four days that I have spent here. Mm. It came from this place. Mm. And it's like you're feeling um, not only sisterhood here, mm. but some kind of power, mm. some kind of openness, and some kind of sharing an experience. And I would say it's very emotional. Mm. And it is great. Ah. It is great to feel it. Um, a little bit about my background, um, just just before I contribute. Yeah. Um, I am coming from Poland. I am working in a uh, feminist NGO. I am also a part of grassroots movement, and I did my uh, academic work uh, in feminism too. Yeah. Um, we have now the discussion uh, within the feminism after um, a book about motherhood by Agnieszka Graf, who is quite a famous feminist mm -hmm. in Poland, um, but she's considered... Um, this type, you know, uh, middle class white mother. Mm -hmm. So when she is telling about the hardship of motherhood, she is said to be privileged. Yeah. So some of the feminists from the grassroots, some of the precarity mothers, they say, um, they, they mm, how to say, they criticize her mm -hmm. because of that. So this is one contribution, we have this discussion. Um, another thing is that uh, we also have very strict abortion law mm. and uh, we had a protest two days ago uh, when um, after, after uh, this incident that a lady was um, denied um, abortion which she could have done by law even mm. though it's very strict. Mm. She should have been allowed and she was denied mm. and now uh, her life is endangered and for sure the baby will not be able to uh, to live after mm. the birth mm. uh, so it's very hard and mm. we had this protest mm -hmm. and we do those protests um, on and on because the law is strict they want to ban abortion completely and this is the situation. So 4,800 people clicked like on Facebook for the protest and only 100 came to yeah. protest. Mm. So we are dealing with this problem that everybody is, you know, do it and do it for yourself. Mm. Go abroad, um, find some medicine from Women on Waves, Women on Web, mm. um, find a doctor and pay, mm. and so on. So one question um, that I will have to you is, uh, would you suggest any ways of mobilizing those people who think that they shouldn't contribute to the movement, they mm. shouldn't speak openly, um, if they can um, do something with this problem when it's theirs, mm. just for yeah, just just mm. for one person. Mm. Um, and my contribution was um, um, as a maybe uh, adding to what you have said about the migrant woman. Mm. When I arrived here, mm. um, I am uh, right now with my um, in a partnership with my girlfriend. Yes, and I was like, how come? You have this kindergarten with um, those, um, you know, rainbows everywhere. Mm. Um, how come oh. you can see two ladies with the children in the street and nobody's watching? Mm. Yes, I knew it will be like this, but experiencing this is a completely different thing. Yeah. And I thought, um, mm, yes, I would like to contribute to the change in Poland. Yeah. Yes, I speak openly that I am with a woman. Yeah. Yes, I am strong. Yes, I have my sisters around me. Mm. I, feel, I feel powerful, but I don't have social care. Mm. I don't have um, support from the state. Yeah. I don't have, we have like kindergartens around, uh, in around 10% comparing to needs. Wow. Um, and if I have a child with my partner, I would not be uh, considered we have not no civil partnerships or marriages, yes. so I will not be considered a mother, or she would not be, um, and um, and I will have to face homophobia, and my child will have to face homophobia, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And before we make this great change, I might not be able to have children yeah. before the consciousness of people changes. Yes. So if I will be coming here, yeah. many people would say, yes, you want to benefit from this system. No, I want to benefit from the consciousness. I just want to have normal life. Mm. That's it. Mm. And finish the struggle. Yes, hello. Thank you. Yes. Lovely to be here. And 
And I, I agree with, with the speaker. What a wonderful and moving yeah. speech. Thanks so much. And I'm going to respond yeah. to the questions. I'm just going to hear everyone, and I'm going to try to hold it all together. So don't think I didn't hear your questions. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, um, I'd like to ask about the downside of motherhood. Yes. Which is the divorce culture that we're living in right now. Yes. And you were talking about separations. But in, in, in the life of a divorced mother, there are so many different uh, uh, separations and so much pain. Yes. So I'd like to hear about your thoughts, th your thoughts on the language that we need. Uh -huh. We do need a new language Wonderful. maybe there. Yes, so great question. My question. Thanks. Okay, Thanks. got it. Fabulous. Very close to my heart at the moment. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm from Norway. Okay. And we are kind of the world best in so-called equality. Hmm. And when we introduced uh, an increased um, uh, leave for, the f for parents when, when the child is very small, we gave 14 weeks to the man and 14 weeks to the woman because they were supposed to be alike, uh -huh. which in fact mean, meant a more difficult situation for the women. Right. So we are fighting very hard to make both uh, the value of the women and, and care work in general mm -hmm. uh, be increased. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, because if you are a father and you take leave, you're progressive. If you're a mother, you take leave, you're egoistic. Right. And then the middle of it all, and so I would like to invite you to come to Norway. Oh, thank you. And then in the, mid in the middle of it all, they, they, they all forget the child. And what yes. I was very happy that you said, talked about was, what about the child? Yeah. And when I was young studying psychology, we learned that it was extremely important for to, to the first year for the child to develop basic trust. Yes. If they didn't develop basic trust, then they became very insecure and so on. Now... We're in our country now, we're afraid to say that the mother and father is different in the f child's first year of life, which is just crazy. Right. And we speak about breastfeeding as being only milk. Right. But I mean, it has to do with bas basic social learning. And what kind of people do we want our society to have? I mean, egoistical, insecure individualists or people who can live in community and take care of the whole of the community and also be caring. Well, that has something to do with what we, what we experience in the first year of life. So I think I would support you very much on that, and uh, we'll find a way of getting you to Norway. Okay, thank you so much. I'd be happy I, I also to raised my hand. I'm, okay. I'm from Norway, too. Okay, Norway and I have is representing in the yeah. house, Norway. Yes, well, okay. as, because um, well, I, I am a family researcher, and I, am, I have for a long time been very uncomfortable with some of the outcomes of our gender-neutral uh, egalitarian uh, ideas of parenthood because of the effects on mothers, and I have uh, used the M word sometimes. Uh -huh. Which You've used what word? The M word. Oh, the M word, okay. And that's, <laughs> we don't use it. It's, it has vanished from our language. We have parents and we have fathers. Wow. Yes. Um, and I just wanted to draw your, so I'm very happy with your observations, also seeing from the outside the kind of silencing that I have been very frustrated uh, about. And I would just wanted to, uh, to have a little commercial here. This is okay. my safe haven for okay. communication oh about uh, motherhood, and I have to go to Canada, ah. where they use the M word. And here is a feminist, uh, feminist press, press on, on motherhood, motherhood. Beautiful. Um, publishing a lot of wonderful titles, uh -huh. doing twi two conferences a year, um, having all these discussions wonderful. about everything about motherhood. Oh. Great. Thank you so much. The M word is very, that is very intense. Okay. I, I think we... Should I try to answer? Yes, before? I think you th should okay. try to, because it would be very unfair to you. Okay, <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Um, so your question uh, about how to make change, for how to encourage people to be a part of some kind of larger social movement, that's a question that I've been asked for 20, since I started doing this work, um, and it's a question that's very difficult to answer, you know. Uh, and I, I generally say that we try to meet people where they are and find out what their language is and what their needs are and to organize around things that are very meaningful to them. Um, and, to, and, and then they're activated out of a sense of need. But the more, and, and it's interesting you brought up the, the issue of social media, because the more people are online and relating online, it's harder to get bodies actually mobilized. And so 
um, you know, I have started to shift into thinking that we need to utilize social media much more than we do because that seems to have a greater impact on, on raising the social consciousness, right? Because people are making things go viral like, you know, the Coney um, video. I don't know if you saw. Uh, anyway, um, and so to be more creative and engaged in creating uh, social media that can then transform consciousness for forever, you know, or for at least a generation, instead of having bodies show up in a certain place is something that I value and think is relevant. Um, because coming out of the civil rights movements and seeing my parents protest, and then looking at my generation and seeing how they don't want to do that, it seems like an, an anathema, it seems like a throwback to do that work. And But at the same time, I'm seeing my generation find other ways of challenging these social norms, be it starting socially conscious businesses, be it start, you know, creating these viral sensations that awaken people, um, creating different kinds of media. You know, so I think we have to become more grounded in the reality of how we relate to, to one another now and not be so disappointed when the people don't show up but find another way to make their voices heard. Yeah, and I'm not quite sure in every situation I think that's different. But I don't want us to feel depressed and demoralized because the people don't show up, you know. It's even like today, we were hoping, you know, many, many people would come, yeah? And you are many, many people and you're beautiful and we're so happy you're here. But we and, and but I refuse, you know, to be to feel that 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 there's anyone missing from this room, you know. You are here because you're supposed to be here, and I believe that. And so it doesn't matter, you know, four people could come, and it would be the right four people. And so, you know, we want to keep our hope always. We want to believe, you know, and so um, I think it's important not to become demoralized within this, this work. You know, you have to hold yourself. And I'm so happy to hear this, this discussion here about immigrants being, coming to the country to benefit and profit and, 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 and your position of coming wanting to be able to be with a woman, your partner, and have your child grow up in a safe environment. Um, I'm just so glad that you both brought the, those, those, uh, your experiences to the, to the discussion because I think they're so important, you know. Um, and also, the idea of middle class women who are talking about the struggles of motherhood being marginalized and being criticized, that's something that happens. I mean, we've talked about in the States, the women's movement being pre predominantly privileged white women, right? And so, um, for women of color, a lot of their issues seem very far and very, like, privileged. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think it's important to create a space in which all of these perspectives are valid and valued and not to just say, well, because they're privileged, you know, but to help them understand their privilege because often they don't even know their privilege. So then we introduce the language of privilege to the discourse and then, you know, little by little change happens, right? Because then we, you know, people of color, we talk about white privilege, right? So it's not just socioeconomic privilege. But you can then alienate people that you need to be your allies when you do that. We all need to be each other's allies. And as you know, as you know, I'm also bisexual and I've been with women and I've raised kids with women. You know, we need straight people to be our allies, you know. We, we can't just say, well, they have straight privilege and then just cut them off, you know. Or as a woman of color, I can't just cut off all white people because I need white people to work as hard on their racism as anybody else. I mean, I need them to work harder, <laughs> you know. So finding a way to stay connected as human beings, you know, as opposed to just being so critical um, is, very, is very important, I think. So um, this question of divorce, big issue, um, you know, Right now in the States, we're dealing with a lot of pathologizing of single mothers. And a lot of those single mothers come out of, and I'm sure that's here too, right? But single mothers are like the whipping boy, you know, people of every culture practically. I don't know. But so, you know, we've been starting to talk about how important it is to kind of reclaim and revision what it means to be a single mom. Because when you look on television or in the movies in, in the States, single mothers are always, you know, you know, they're not paying attention to their kids, they're, you know, they're, they're haggard, they, you know, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, there's a kind of horrible view um, that's very disempowering. 
And I connect that in some ways with women who have gone through divorce, you know, and and so there's a kind of stigma that you that you weren't able to stick it out or that you failed somehow, as opposed to this idea of natural evolution of relationships sometimes is is real. You know, you may not just, you know, it's maybe not supposed to be with this person forever. And how do we create a language and a culture in which children are taken care of in that, in that, in that evolution of relationship? Um, so we're doing a lot, I think, in the States, I'm familiar with, you know, how best to take care of children in that and to, and to sort of accept that, that, that forever is not necessarily the only way and the only context in which children can be healthy and, and stable, right? And then more support for women who, who are going through the painful experience of divorce. It's, it's, it's very difficult. So, you know, I think just, uh, I hope that's helpful in some way. I relate. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about this idea of no more M word. <laughs> you know, that motherhood is sort of being erased that I, I'm not familiar with that, so we would need a long conversation for me to be able to to speak to that. Um, but I find it frightening because you know, and I was saying at dinner the other night that there's a famous doctor, E. L. Doctor, is a novelist, and he wrote a book about um, a community that was trying to make everyone equal, and to make everyone equal, they did things like um, you know the 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 brilliant prodigy. Pianists were made to wear big iron gloves because that would equalize them in the culture. And painters were made to wear dark glasses so they couldn't see any better or paint any better. You know. And so the obliteration of difference, you know, in some ways is crippling. You know, it's crippling because we, we are different and that's okay, you know. And it's interesting to me that in the name of equality, there is this this rendering invisible of, of woman. And mothers, that's what it sounds like you're saying. And, and, and that, you know, if that comes out of feminist ideology, because we believe that if we use and continue to identify as mothers, we are colluding in essentialism, then we are actually participating with a patriarchal idea of rendering us invisible. So that is horrible. <laughs> I mean, that's just like... Um, so I would support you in not in in, in this, <laughs> you know, in continuing to claim motherhood. Uh, yes, and and from Norway too, what you're saying that it's they're not the same, you know, and the idea that you can you can just have attachment with the husband or wife and it's the same, you know, and 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 that nursing is just feeding, you know, it's not. It's 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 the primary, you know, it's the beginning. Your child comes from your womb, for God's sake. I mean, you know. You know, to give and to say that to give the child over to anyone else is the same. You know, you, there's smell, there's touch, there's all of the different ways that we don't even understand how we are related. Um, so, so I very much uh, support any effort to make sure that that primacy of attachment is maintained, even as we support men in their connection, you know but they're different, and it's okay. It's not the end of the world, you know, to allow for difference. It doesn't mean that we won't have equality. We can still have difference and equality. In fact, we must have difference and equality because we're all different. <laughs> you know, that's one of the things that's so important about what these two women are talking about. If they have to be the same as everyone in order to have equality, it will never happen. Yeah? Okay. Did I cover everything? I tried. Okay. okay. Do, do, do we have, do we have time? Yes. We have time. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, an issue that um, kind of scares me when it comes to the Swedish society um, is the fact that as uh, a mother or as, well, I guess as parents or as a mother, we are basically told that we are not enough. Uh-huh. Um, we... Um, well, we say at one years old, we're supposed to put them in daycare, um, but it, it, that's, not, that's not all of it. It's not all about going out to work. It's also, we're told, that we're not enough as mothers. Yes. We're not enough 
um, sorry, now I'm getting emotional. It's very emotional. Um, <laughs> I'm getting it's emotional. It's a huge thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but that, that we're, um, I just think about, I, I'm quite a confident mother in, in a lot of ways, um, but I also, you know, um, I, you know, and then I, then I look at other mothers that I meet that aren't as confident and how they then um, say, oh, well, you know, my, my child is one now, so they're going to go to daycare. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, that's fine. You know, that's, that's fine. Right. But, you know, um, when I hear that they say it's because, well, they need, they need daycare. Right. Um, because I'm not enough. Right. That's what scares me. Oh, that's terrifying. And, and, that, <laughs> and then that, when I say that, that's huge. That's huge, huge. in Sweden. Yes, um, we've I mean, been talking almost, a little bit about that. Yeah. Yes. I, I think, add something yes, to that? Yes, absolutely. Um, you, they did, uh, uh, kind of not research, but a pa- I read a paper mm. about how Europe was going to reach the goal, the mm. Lisbon goal, of having, I think, 70% of women in workforce mm. by year 2000, was it? Mm. And they, they saw that how they were so successful, we have been so successful here, is because we have daycare workers that have three-year college education Mm -hmm. to become daycare workers. Mm -hmm. So we are convinced Mm -hmm. that uh, they are better, they are educated to to raise our children better than we are ourselves after one year old. Yeah. So that's why it has been so successful that women are convinced that we are not enough. Yes. Well, that is... Deep propaganda. <laughs> I mean, as all of it is, right? I mean, and, 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 you know, again, this idea of using this ideology and this information to disempower women is shocking. I mean, if you're going to tell a woman that another person can raise your own child more competently than you can because they've had three years of university training, the, the, the damage to your self-esteem as a mother is profound. I mean, even in the States, when, when people, you know, look at you and say, well, you shouldn't, do, you know, if, when people say anything to me about how I'm raising my child, I become very, you know, I try to be open. But, you know, at the same time, you know, I know what my child needs. I, and I trust that. And the moment that I don't trust it is the moment that often things go wrong. And, and I don't believe that other people... Um, have that gut feeling about what's right for my child. It's something that I can't explain. And so I, I just am horrified to hear that. And, um, and I hope that we can change that, you know, and I hope that we can create other propaganda, you know. And, and I know we have, we have some studies we were talking about that um, the women who, who you know, we were talking about how in three generations you can you can change a pattern, you know. And so, if in th- if if we have mothers who don't know how to take care of their children, and then those children don't know how to take care of their children, you know, then at what point do, do any of us? How can we care for anyone? I mean, we have kids coming out and they don't know how to take care. I mean, it's just that's a nightmare. <laughs> um, and we just give them over to some specialist, you know. Um, So I think, uh, just to conclude, one of the most powerful feelings for me in terms of being competent has been trusting my own instinct about raising my child. And even if I'm wrong sometimes, and I am, um, I'm right enough times to have been strengthened in my sense of who I am you know, and my wisdom. And that's been incredibly empowering for me, you know. And it's the moments when people tell me that I don't know or that I should defer to someone else, that I feel inadequate, you know. And that's not what we should be doing to each other. And that's not what the state should be doing. That is not appropriate, (laughs) in my view. I mean, if you wanted to do something, then help women to feel more comfortable with their instinct. Don't displace it and outsource it. Raising children is not a professional endeavor. 
It's that, that's that intellectual overview. It's not that. Exactly. Exactly. Seriously, right? I mean, it's gone by like this. My kid is nine. It's what? You know, it's going to be over, you know, soon. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I, I'm, that's what I am saying. Totally. And, and I think they're doing that from this idea that maybe it will be better for women somehow. But it's not, there's got to be a different way to change this that doesn't damage women. Yes, we want women to be able to put their children in daycare so that they can work sometimes. We need to have that option of social support. But you don't, you don't, you don't force women to, to take that option by making them feel badly about their own intuitive truths. Yes. 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 You really need that, you all. I support you. I'll do whatever I can to help. <laughs> Sir, we need to cut the okay. discussion. Okay, we'll cut the discussion. Because they are waiting outside. Oh, they're waiting outside. And I would okay. like to occupy the room for the whole day, because uh -huh. this is a, such an important discussion. I really hope that we can continue. Uh -huh. um, please contact us, and we, we maybe should m make more seminars include motherhood into feminism, start a third wave feminism <laughs> in Sweden as well. <laughs> and we just thank you so much. You are so you. welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we just want to give you this. Oh, present. I love presents.